Physics students, just when you thought that Newton was out of your life, <clears throat> we're going we're gonna to bring him back and we're going to talk about uh, what some people consider to be his fourth law, and that's called the Newton's, uh, Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. And in fact, this law is so important that it essentially governs everything in the universe and how everything in the universe interacts with every other thing in the universe, so it's a really big deal. The first thing we're going to talk about is this idea of what we call point masses, okay? All right, remember, of course, Newton's second law, F equals ma, all right? An apple falls at, an, at a certain acceleration, that's 9.81 meters per second squared, on the surface of this planet Earth, okay? The Earth pulls the apple towards its center, we know that. So the, so the apple falls what we, what we perceive as being down towards the surface of the Earth. A 200 gram apple, for example, has a weight of about 2 newtons because that's m times g. By newton, the apple also pulls the earth up to meet it. It has to. The earth has to accelerate up towards the apple. You ever thought about that? We didn't talk about this much when we talked about Newton's second and third laws. But here we go. I want you to, in example one, determine the acceleration of the Earth towards a 200 gram apple, taking the mass of the Earth to be 5.98 times 10 to the 24th kilograms. Go ahead and try that. Wow. You better get a small acceleration. That is the reason why we don't feel the Earth accelerating up to meet the apple. It does accelerate upwards, okay? Because by Newton's third law, FAE, as I have it shown here, is equal to FEA. FAE is the force of the Earth upon the apple. FEA is the force of the apple upon the Earth. Using F equals MA, in this case, we get 3.28 times 10 to the minus 24 meters per second squared. That's really tiny. You will never, ever, ever feel that. But be aware that everything is accelerating towards everything else in the universe on this level. Wow. Pretty mind-blowing. Okay? So the fact is that every particle of matter in the universe attracts every other particle with a force which is directly proportional to the product of their masses and inversely proportional to the square of their distances. We have talked about this a little bit before in a previous physics class. In other words, everything attracts every other thing in the universe. It's pretty heavy, okay? This force is called the force of gravity. Or in other words, weight. Weight and the force of gravity are exactly the same thing. I have m1, mass 1, m2, mass 2, okay? Separated by a distance r, by Newton's third law, the force that m2 exerts on m1 is the same as the force that m1 exerts on m2, okay? In a simple case of the moon going around the Earth, okay? All right, here you go. These little blue vectors, those are the force vectors. They are equal and oppositely directed. Notice how the moon pulls the earth slightly towards it. The, the, the earth actually actually wobbles in its orbit slightly because the moon pulls it, okay? Wow, crazy stuff. Same force. Also, the earth accelerates much less because it is, it is much more massive. And what is the force that causes the moon to go around the earth? What is this force? It's the force of gravity, but it's also the centripetal force, and that is an example of equating um, the centripetal force to another force, and that's what we're going to do a lot in this section of the course, okay? All right, this idea, inversely proportional to the square of their distances, what the heck does that mean? What that means is that if you measure the force of gravity between two objects against their distance apart, you end up with a nice inverse squared law, okay? You may have remembered doing this at some point in your previous physics life before this class. Anyway, another way of writing this is F equals A over D squared. Okay, This is a logger pro uh, screenshot of, of actual gravity data. Or more generally, we're going to say that the force of gravity is proportional to 1 over D squared, which means that if I graph the force of gravity on the y-axis against 1 over D squared on the x-axis, what would I get? A straight line going through the origin. This kind of law is called an inverse squared law because the x variable is squared on the bottom of the right-hand side. Okay, Now, because the force of gravity is proportional to 1 over d squared, okay, we're going we, we're gonna, to we're, we're gonna, we're gonna put that aside just for a second, and we're going to note the fact that it also turns out that the force of gravity is proportional to the mass 1 and mass 2 
Putting all of this together, we can then write that the force of gravity is proportional to m1 times m2 all over d squared. You see what I've done? I've put three proportionalities in as one, okay? And you know by now in my class that if we ever need to make a proportionality into an equals, what do we have to add? A constant. Turns out that that constant has a value. It's called the gravitational constant. It's called Newton. Well, the gravitational constant, which is the, the implication is that it's used as in um, Newton's law of universal um, gravitation. G is 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11. And you can check the, um, the units as Newton meter squared over kilogram squared. So there you go. This law right here, this equation, this is Newton's, you can think of it as his fourth law. It's Newton's law of universal gravitation. And it's super important, OK? All right. So let's do kind of something kind of funny here. Let's figure out the force of attraction between two students pictured below using Newton's law of universal gravitation. Try this one. Okay, really simple. F equals gm1 m2 over d squared. Okay, plugging in the numbers, you get 2.5 times 10 to the minus 7 newtons. That's why these students standing in a room do not feel like they are being pulled together and stuck together like glue. It's never going to happen because the forces are really, really small, but they're there. Try this one. Gravitational force of attraction between the sun and the earth. Another way to think about it is what is the weight of the earth in the um, sun's gravitational field? Whoa. 3.53 times 10 to the 22 newtons. Now, would the, would the earth feel that force? Would anyone feel that force? You bet. That's what's keeping the earth going around the sun is that force. That's a heck of a force. And that's equal to mv squared over r. So you can imagine how we would use this to solve... Uh, further problems, which we will later. Okay, now a couple of things about gravity. Uh, one of the most important things about gravity is that um, it's attractive only. You cannot have two objects repulsing one another gravitationally. That has never been shown to that. Have, that has never been discovered. Um, to be the case anywhere in the universe, okay? If we discover that that indeed is possible, then that would uh, obviously change some fundamental physics ideas. But as of now, the gravitational force is only attractive. The law uh, only applies to point masses. And a point mass is an infinitely small point where all the mass is considered to be concentrated. Point masses don't really exist because they have no volume. The interaction between two spherical masses is the same as if all the mass in that sphere, we're concentrated at the center of the sphere, or the center of gravity if it's not spherical. And that's important because the distance between the two spheres, we take the distance between the two centers when we're using Newton's law of universal gravitation. It doesn't matter what's in the space between the two objects, gravity still exerts a force between them. Okay? Now, example four. How'd you guys do this one? Verify all the values in the following table. So go ahead and get out a sheet of paper and verify all of these relative masses and the relative force and you'll see that you have squared numbers on the bottom like 4 which is 2 squared, um, 9 which is 3 squared, 16 which is 4 squared and so forth. Okay so go ahead and try that one. Okay we'll, and we'll go through that one in, in, um, in, in class if you guys need to. Okay all right now this one's more interesting. We're back to that 200 gram apple. Determine the weight of a 200 gram apple or in other words, the force of gravity between them. Okay. Well, you might be thinking, well, W just equals mg. What a dumb thing to do, Mr. Smith. Why should I use F equals g m1 m2 over d squared when I can just use mg? I'm going to show you that it's the same thing. The force of gravity is mg. That's 1.96 newtons. We did that before. Watch this. g m, mass of the apple, mass of the earth, distance between them, which is the radius of the earth if you're on the surface. Check it out. You get 1.96 newtons. Exactly the same thing, and it better be. This works like everything else in physics. Okay? Okay. I'm going to talk a little bit more about weight. F equals ma. F equals mg. That's F equals ma, which is uh, also w. In the case below, at the surface of the Earth, we have that the force of gravity is g, the mass of the Earth, which I'm going to, which I'm denoting by the big M. Little m is the mass of this ball or object. Big R is the radius of the Earth. GMM over R squared equals MG. That equals weight. Okay. Solving for little g, which is the acceleration due to gravity, as you know, we get g times big M, the mass of the Earth, all over the radius of the Earth squared. Now, this applies to any body. The acceleration due to gravity due to any body that has a mass M and a radius R 
is given by this right here. The acceleration due to gravity does not depend on whatever little mass is in it that's being accelerated. It should not. The acceleration due to gravity on the surface of this planet is 9.81 meters per second squared. It means that I can drop a spoon or a bowling ball, and they're both going to accelerate at the same rate. We know that in this class. Okay, This is mathematical proof of that if you want to go that far. Okay, Try example 6 on your own. I'm asking you to find the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the Earth. Okay, You know that's 9.81 meters per second squared. Well, using this, you get that number. Okay, now another maybe more ridiculous question. <laughs> find the acceleration due to gravity on the surface of a tennis ball. Does it have an acceleration due to gravity? Sure it does, but it's really tiny, okay? And you would never be, be attracted towards a tennis ball. You wouldn't be like flung across the room and stuck to a tennis ball because the tennis ball is not able to exert that much force and therefore that much acceleration on you. You get it? Pretty cool, okay? All right. So just uh, some accelerations due to gravity comparisons of different objects in the solar system. This is pretty cool, okay? Um, notice any relations, relationships here? Okay, mass, radius, acceleration due to gravity. The sun is the most horrible place to be. Um, if you were to drop something on the surface of the sun, it would accelerate at 30 times the rate of anything on the Earth. Um, Pluto, on the other hand, an object would fall very, very slowly. Anyway, pretty cool stuff. There's the Earth right there. Okay, 9.81 and 1. Notice that the last column here is giving g as a as a multiple of g of the Earth. Okay. Now on the Earth, this is kind of interesting. Look at these values. It's actually not constant on the surface of the Earth. Why would that be? Well, it turns out uh, it's not constant because different locations on the Earth are actually different distances from the center of the Earth. The Earth bulges at the equator. So if you're standing on a mountaintop at the equator, you're as far from the center of the Earth as you possibly could be and still be on the surface, okay? Also, elevation plays a role. Here's Pikes Peak in Colorado. It's 4,300 meters. So the acceleration is uh, due to gravity is a little bit lower on the top of Pikes Peak than it is in Denver uh, at the base of Pike, or not at the base of Pikes Peak, but at at a lower elevation in the same state, okay? Um, so the farther away you get from the center of the Earth, uh, the less the acceleration due to gravity, and that makes sense because I had the R squared on the bottom. R squared is the distance, R is the distance, okay? All right, anyway, just a couple of numbers here. The equatorial radius, radius is significantly greater than the polar radius. That's pretty cool that you didn't know that. Okay, more about the units of G, okay? G is weight over mass, okay? Well, we're going to very soon start expressing um, G not in meters per second squared, but in newtons per kilogram. And notice that a newton per kilogram is what? Check it out! It's a meter per second squared. Wow. Okay, try example seven on your own. Acceleration due to gravity on a planet 10 times as massive as the Earth with a radius 20 times as large. Does your intuition tell you that it's going to be greater than or less than the acceleration due to gravity on the Earth? Hmm. Well, let's let's check it out. Okay. All right. Plugging the numbers in. G. Little g equals big G times the mass of the planet over the radius squared. I've got 10 MEs and 20 REs. What do you get? Well, it turns out that it's less. Okay. And why is that? Because um, the effect of a bigger radius on the bottom has a greater effect than the directly proportional effect of mass on the top. It's because of that squared term that causes this to be really small. Okay? All right. So the effect of increasing the radius has a much larger effect of increasing the mass because of the inverse squared term. Okay. Got it? Get it? Got it? Good. Okay. Last one in this video. Last example. Try this one. The acceleration due to gravity at a height of 300 kilometers from the surface of the Earth. Okay, this, this diagram is to scale. Notice that 300 kilometers is not that far above the Earth. Wow, it's like nothing. Look at that. It's hardly even out of the atmosphere. Okay, I got that it's 9.804. And to do this, what you have to do is you have to do some slightly more complicated math. Okay, you have to add the height to the r on the bottom squared term, so it's re plus h. This becomes a little bit bigger. I get 9.804. I've added extra significant figures to demonstrate that the difference is not very much. Okay, so make sure you can work through all of these cool examples. We'll be doing more advanced stuff, stuff with um, gravitation and fields shortly.